Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. In the center of the expensive children's store stood a chubby little boy. He appeared to be about six years old, no older. In his right hand, he held an ice cream cone, while his left hand tightly gripped his mother's palm. The strawberry ice cream ball was almost melted. Just a couple more minutes, and it would splatter onto the perfectly clean floor as a liquid, sticky stain. The boy's reddish chestnut hair was smoothly and neatly combed, and on his little feet were adorned expensive little boots. The boy didn't know the brand of his boots, and he didn't really care. It wasn't interesting to him. What wasn't interesting to him, however, was of great importance to his mother. The boy's mother was a tall, slender woman of middle age who always looked impeccable. Her impeccable taste extended to the smallest details. She stood proudly, straightening her broad shoulders. Her short haircut of dyed black hair resembled the hairstyles of Disney villains. A white fur coat was casually draped over her slender shoulders. She cast a careless glance around the room, silently exuding an air of disdain. Where are those lazy idiots, seemed to be written in her unspoken words. Paul, have you chosen what you want, she asked, looking at her son. Paul lifted his gaze with his green eyes and looked at his mother from bottom to top. This car, and this one, and the doll, he said. Paul, her gaze turned stern, dolls are for girls. And you're a future man. Take this toy gun. With a long, well-groomed hand adorned with neat red manicure, she pointed to the stand with toy weapons. Little Paul was already turning around to see what his mom wanted him to take when suddenly, from behind, a surprised voice was heard. You can't bring food in here. A young girl, a sales consultant from the store, approached them from behind. Ma'am, just look at what your son has done. Now we have to clean up here. Oh, how she was angry, but the position in such a store didn't allow her to fully express that anger. Her voice sounded quite calm but firm. The boy became embarrassed, shy, and hopefully looked at his mom. After all, it's his mom. She's always right. So take it and clean up. The dark-haired woman almost hissed out this phrase. Slowly, maintaining her posture, she approached the sales consultant and declared. Know your place, girl. One word from me, no, one displeased look from me, and you're fired. Go. She barked out the last word as if forgetting about etiquette. Sorry, the girl squeaked it quietly and plaintively, like a cornered animal. She turned around and hurried away. The boy admired his mom, thinking, she's so cool. He playfully stomped his little foot right into the sticky puddle, causing the fallen ice cream to scatter in different directions. With laughter, he called after the girl. Go, know your place. My son, the mom proudly stroked the boy's head. Twenty years had passed, maybe even more. The boy couldn't remember exactly how much time had passed. Well, he couldn't remember the toy store incident either. There were plenty of situations where his mom put the service staff in their place, and the boy couldn't remember them all. Besides, he hadn't been a boy for a long time. He was now a grown, mature man. His reddish chestnut hair had darkened, his chin was hidden behind a neatly trimmed, rugged stubble, and there was no trace of the chubby little Paul. Now he was Mr. Paul, tall, strong, a bit on the plump side. Yet, to his loving mother, he still remained Paul. Paul, Paul, hello, an excited female voice came from the receiver, Paul, I can't hear you, come to me quickly, hello. Enough already. Paul shouted out loud and dismissed his mother's call. He intended to stuff the phone into his pocket, but a slightly impaired coordination prevented him from doing so, and the expensive smartphone crashed onto the marble floor with its delicate screen facing down. He staggered a bit, most likely influenced by the recently consumed glass of whiskey. The employee standing opposite him in the car showroom involuntarily gasped. A phone like that cost three times his monthly salary. Don't squeal, are the documents ready? Paul's voice sounded relaxed. Everything is ready, Mr. Paul, the employee straightened up and puffed out his chest. He knew very well that customers like this one should be handled with care, as if they were not human but ancient relics. 
He knew Paul well. Paul bought one of the most expensive cars regularly, every six months or even more frequently. So even the incident when Mr. Paul vomited right on the floor of the VIP sales hall had to be endured. The main thing was a satisfied customer. The showroom employee squatted down, carefully turned the phone over, and exclaimed again. Of course, your phone. The screen is shattered, the guy said excitedly. Keep it for yourself, Paul said on exhale, then let out a belch. The showroom employee didn't react. Paul smiled. I'll buy a new one. And anyway, why are you whining? You guys are so narrow-minded. My God. I'm leaving. Turning on his heels, Mr. Paul, slightly swaying, walked towards his new car. Paul, wait. The employee hesitantly approached the man from behind. He wanted to touch his shoulder but didn't dare. Are you going to drive in this condition? In what condition? Idiot. Paul's eyes widened. He turned around and arrogantly pulled the guy closer by the badge hanging on his chest. Wall. Walter. So, Whaler. I drive in whatever condition I want. Is that clear? And the opinions of people like you don't concern me. Not at all. I'm free. He was about to leave, but then stopped. Snatching the broken phone from Walter's hands, Mr. Paul forcefully threw it to the floor once again. Now you won't install it, your fault. Don't stick your nose where it's not wanted. Mr. Paul turned around and, with a slightly crooked gait, went to get the keys to his car. Walter picked up the shattered phone, threw it into the trash bin, and went to find a cleaner. The entire floor was littered with shards. No matter how Mr. Paul behaved, whatever he allowed himself, and whatever he did, it didn't upset Walter as much as the fact that such a driver lived in the same city with him and drove on the same roads. The realization that Mr. Paul could harm not only himself, but also others drove Walter into a state of panic. He shook his head, trying to shake off the frightening thoughts. He took out his simple phone and sent a couple of SMS to his friends and sister. Car such and such, no plates, be careful. Drunk idiot behind the wheel. Better not drive anywhere today unless necessary. Paul held the steering wheel with one hand, the other holding a bottle of expensive whiskey. He pulled out the cork with his teeth and took a few sips. Not paying much attention to the road, he pressed the gas pedal to the floor and rushed towards his mother's country house. However annoying she was, he couldn't cut ties with her, he depended on her completely. The new car no longer brought him any joy. He had wrecked the previous one less than a month ago. Overall, very little pleased him anymore. He coughed after another gulp of whiskey, stopped at the traffic light, and lit a cigarette. He didn't want to go there at all. This old lady was getting on his nerves. He had no strength left. Paul's mother was a dignified, noble woman. With age, her broad shoulders had become more slender, and her hair had turned gray. Black hair no longer suited her, and the fashion had changed entirely. Nevertheless, despite quite logical age-related changes, Ms. Darcia looked a hundred percent. And it's hard to look bad when your entire life is a continuous fairy tale. Mr. Albert, Paul's father, was truly a great man. He passed away when little Paul was only eight years old. All the fortune that Mr. Albert had accumulated throughout his complex life passed on to his wife and son. And this fortune allowed them to live to the fullest for several generations ahead. There was so much money that even when Paul, already a mature man, didn't fully understand where this money came from. It seemed that he and his mother had a network of shopping centers, billion-dollar accounts in foreign banks, cinemas, some construction projects, maybe something else. But what exactly? Paul wasn't sure, and, frankly, he didn't care. Money was there, money is there, money will be there, where they come from was already the tenth thing. He pressed on the gas and sped through a red light. The alcohol he had consumed had weakened his hands, and his legs had stopped responding altogether. Paul got even more agitated. Why should I bother when she feels like it? She's already gone nuts. These thoughts raged in his head. 
What he had drunk the day before, like a gust of wind, dispersed this anger, turning the whirlwind of rage into a real insane storm. Ms. Darcia, Paul's mom, loved her only son more than anyone else in the world. After her husband's death, all her attention and love went only to him, her beloved son. In this world, there was nothing she could forbid him or deny him. It's hard to say whether such permissiveness influenced who Paul eventually became. Did the money that came to Paul effortlessly affect him? Maybe it was all in the genes. Ms. Darcia, of course, understood that she wasn't a perfect gift either. Perhaps her son was just too absorbed in himself. There was no answer to this question. The fact that once a small, chubby Paul had grown into a rude, self-abandoned idler, Ms. Darcia understood very well. Did she love him any less because of it? Of course not. But Paul's lifestyle began to scare her to some extent. She knew too many stories of carefree golden youth losing their lives in yet another alcoholic, or worse, narcotic stupor. One sunny day, over a glass of red wine, Ms. Darcia made a crucial decision for their small family. Perhaps you think she was planning to cut off Paul's financial support? Or maybe she was going to make him work? Hold on. Ms. Darcia decided to entrust the reins of her son's life to other tender and young hands with neatly manicured nails. More precisely, she planned to marry her son to a suitable girl of the appropriate social status. Of course, Ms. Darcia was not getting any younger, and Paul needed special care. Since making this decision, Ms. Darcia began her search. The wife for Paul needed to be not just anyone but someone special, of noble blood. She carefully selected candidates not only based on their appearance but also on their status. Their parents, income, and interests all played an important role in such matters. Today, Ms. Darcia arranged another viewing. Sitting on a luxurious light beige leather sofa right in front of her was a young girl named Amelie, the daughter of very influential people. Amelie was not an idler herself, her parents had given her a chain of restaurants, and she enjoyed managing them. In general, there was a limit even to the status. Amelie's pale skin and slender, long hands reminded Ms. Darcia of her own youth. There was something in Amelie that Ms. Darcia once had, nobility, aristocracy, and delicate, strict beauty. Amelie carefully placed a small cup of strong black coffee on the mirrored table with golden edges. Ms. Darcia, with all due respect, how much longer do we have to wait? I have business at the restaurant today. I need to finalize the menu, Amelie said. Amelie, my dear, don't worry. You'll have plenty of time. Paul will be here any moment. Ms. Darcia cast an anxious glance at Bill. This unassuming middle-aged man was her right-hand man, something between a butler and a personal assistant. He took out his mobile phone and tried to reach Paul again. In response to Ms. Darcia's expectant look, Bill shrugged apologetically. The subscriber is unavailable. Amelie, I promise you won't regret it if you wait, Ms. Darcia assured. Ms. Darcia intrigued Amelie as best as she could. She carefully scrutinized her appearance, a slender, long neck, skinny knees protruding from under a black, strict skirt, brown, almost black eyes gazing restrained, without expressing any emotions. Ms. Darcia understood perfectly well that, purely externally, her son might not find her appealing. She had seen those awful women that her son brought home ever since he was a teenager. Horrible, nothing else to call them but women. All plump, vulgar, and indecent. The thought of Paul having bad taste made Ms. Darcia cringe. However, the problem was that Amelie did not see in Paul's taste. She liked Amelie. And that was the main thing. At the moment when it seemed Amelie had lost all patience and was about to leave, the roar of a car engine was heard. Ah. Uh. Here's Paul, Ms. Darcia lit up with happiness. I'll introduce you right away. Contrary to Amelie's expectations, into the spacious living room walked not a well-dressed, elegant, handsome young man but a careless, unkempt guy. A strong smell of alcohol emanated from him, his expensive light brown trousers were stained with something slippery and dark, and Amelie definitely did not want to know what it was. A golden stubble was visible on his wide chin, and his light shirt was not tucked into his trousers, looking as if its owner had worn it about as long as he hadn't shaved. Who is this? 
Amelie turned her head towards the bewildered Ms. Darcia in astonishment. This is, this is my Paul, Amelie. Paul's mom confidently rose from her chair. But it seems something happened to Paul. Poor, poor boy. Maybe you could postpone your business, stay. Wait until Paul gets himself together. At that moment, Paul, having finished another bottle of whiskey, crashed to the floor with a loud thud. He tried to get up on all fours, but to no avail. In reality, although Paul was drunk, he had never been in such a pig-like state. Usually, with this amount of alcohol consumed, Paul could easily stagger home and even make it to his bed. The loud fall in the middle of the room was more like a performance. A performance for his dear mother, so that she would finally leave him alone. And it was also a performance for the dear bride-to-be, so that she wouldn't even think about marrying Paul. No matter who she was or what she presented herself as, Paul had absolutely no desire to get married. At least not to the one his mother was trying to foist upon him. All these refined chicken necks and pale long limbs only evoked disgust, boredom, and monotony in Paul. Amelie stood up from the chair, neatly adjusted her skirt, and without saying anything in response, headed towards the exit. Passing by the fallen Paul on the floor, she seemingly deliberately brushed his hand with her thin, sharp heel. Amelie's long, slender legs carried her away from this house. Goodbye, Ms. Darcia. Paul, she made a long pause, turned around, and looked somewhat ironically at the woman, I hope you find what you're looking for. Bill opened and closed the front door behind her. Clearly, Amelie would not cross the threshold of this house again. Paul, Ms. Darcia literally exclaimed with indignation, Get up, what are you doing? Do you know who her parents are? She approached her son and grabbed him by the collar. Oh my god, did I raise you like this? Mom, I, he began, lifting himself up, then fell silent, trying to find more modest, appropriate words, I don't care about her, and certainly not about her parents. He stood up and nearly tumbled back to the floor. The consumed alcohol was clearly making its presence known. On cottony, disobedient legs, he reached the sofa in the middle of the living room and flopped into its boundless, cool embrace. Slick, dirty traces were left on the white leather upholstery. Paul, maybe you haven't realized it yet, but you need to get married. Have you seen Amelie? Well, how beautiful she is. Besides, she's wealthy, well-mannered, and you didn't even give her a chance. How do I now convince her for another meeting? If she's not an idiot, she won't agree to another meeting for anything. Paul chuckled, took a deep breath, and continued. Mom, your Amelie, Eva, Martha are useless to me. How don't you understand? Ms. Darcia gasped, confidently approached her son, and slapped him on the head with a wet towel. What kind of words are these? How dare you speak to me like that? I forbid you to express yourself this way. You have no right to forbid me anything. I am a grown man, leave me alone already. He shouted the last sentence with all his might. You've completely lost it, he jumped to his feet out of anger, his hands clenched into fists. For the first time in her life, Ms. Darcia was genuinely scared of her son. Paul, she reached out her hand to his head in an attempt to comfort him. Get lost. Paul pushed his mother's hand away. His eyes wandered around the room in search of a bottle. He wasn't sure if he brought it here or if he had already finished it. Paul. Ms. Darcia looked at her son as if for the first time. The once thick hair now showed the first signs of baldness, and sticky hair gels stuck out randomly. The innocent sparkle of his big olive eyes turned into two murky, blurred slits. Instead of the abs that Paul had once built in the gym at the tender age of 16, there was a fairly large belly. Sun-kissed freckles on his face were replaced by wrinkles around his forehead, mouth, and eye corners. Paul, the widow sighed sadly, go take a shower and get some sleep, my dear. We'll talk later. Paul's gaze cleared. He looked attentively at his mother. It seemed that it had finally happened. She understood him. She understood that marriage wouldn't make him happy. It seemed that his mother finally realized her mistakes. Um, he couldn't find words. He tried to open his mouth again. It came out again as something incoherent. 
Then he got up and, staggering, went to the shower. Bill, Ms. Darcia cast a stern look at her assistant. I'm already coming, Ms. Darcia. The not-so-young man didn't need words to understand what the mistress wanted from him. He obediently followed Paul, watching to ensure he didn't collapse along the way. His main task now was to be the caretaker for Paul, a grown-up boy. Bill was assigned the role of his babysitter for the next six hours. What if Paul wanted to have a drink? Paul slowly opened his eyes. Through the loosely drawn curtains, a crimson summer sunset was visible. He turned his head slowly, and miraculously, there was a carefully prepared bottle of water on the perfectly white bedside table, placed in a small bucket filled with ice. Next to the bucket was a clean, perfectly transparent crystal glass. Ignoring the glassware, Paul grabbed the bottle with a broad palm. The frozen ice burned his hand, but he eagerly gulped down almost one and a half liters. Damn, Bill, where's the pill, flashed through Paul's mind. Whenever Paul allowed himself to drink too much, which happened quite often, his mom's assistant always left headache pills next to the water. Paul casually ran his hand over the bedside table. It seemed there were no pills. Then he tried to find his mobile phone. That didn't work either. A bright flash of memory crossed Paul's mind, recalling how he angrily threw his phone to the floor. Before, after such adventures, Paul felt ashamed. Sobering up, he remembered the words and actions said or done under the influence and blushed, promising himself never to drink again. Now, however, Paul didn't care about who would think what of him. He struggled to get up. His head felt like it was splitting, and there was an unbearable noise in his ears. It made no sense to look for a pill. Paul knew perfectly well it wouldn't help him. Instead of a bottle of water, a little champagne would have been better. He reached the closed door leading to the room, opened it, and shouted in the doorway. Bill, Bill, damn it. Bring me something to drink. His own scream made his headache even more. He slowly closed the door again. Waiting for Bill, Paul approached the glass sliding door leading to a small balcony. Opening it, he felt the scent of fragrant white roses hit his nose. In his mom's mansion, there was a large and very beautiful garden. He stepped onto the balcony. It was already getting dark outside, but the window's location allowed him to enjoy the sunset to the fullest. The fresh, clean air and the gentle scent of flowers gradually eased Paul's head, until he noticed his mother sipping wine in the garden gazebo. Oh, my God. She's mocking me, Paul exhaled aloud, struggling to push the words out because he saw that his mother was not tasting the wine alone but in the company of a young, tall girl. Ms. Darcia, in turn, upon seeing her son on the balcony of the guest room, broke into a wide smile and waved to her son with a delicate hand. Paul, you woke up. Come to us. I have a surprise for you, she shouted and turned to the girl sitting next to her. Kelly, this is my Paul. What do you think of him? It's hard to say for now. He's far away. I don't see well into the distance, Kelly, the twenty-year-old daughter of Ms. Darcia's friend, smiled modestly. She spent her evening getting acquainted only because her mother threatened to cut off her funds if she didn't meet Ms. Darcia's son. He'll come closer now, and you'll see better. He's just lovely, Paul's mom nodded in confirmation of her words. However, after the incident earlier in the day, she herself was no longer sure about what she was saying. Mr. Paul, drink this, Bill had already entered the room. And be sure to have dinner afterward. He placed a tray with an effervescent tablet and some food on the table in the corner of the room. Paul pointed towards the balcony. Bill, at least a little glass. Mr. Paul, Bill remained firm, they are waiting for you. Take this tablet, I assure you the headache will pass in a moment. Eat and go get acquainted with this wonderful girl. Smiling at Paul from bottom to top, Bill continued. And Mr. Paul, please use a toothbrush. The door closed behind Bill. Damn. Paul was truly irritated. In one sweep, he overturned the tray with food, causing plates, utensils, and food to spill onto the clean carpet. Enough of this. Paul downed the medicine in one gulp and rushed out of the guest room. He couldn't stay in his mother's house any longer.
but when he reached his new car, Paul reconsidered, smirked, and decided to make an appearance in front of his mom. He turned around and headed towards the gazebo. Paul, there you are. Ms. Darcia stood up and approached her son. Meet Kelly. She. Ms. Darcia didn't have a chance to finish. Paul interrupted her. Kelly, dear, go to hell. Ms. Darcia just rolled her eyes, while young Kelly burst into laughter, unable to contain herself. Paul approached the table, grabbed his mother's glass, and quickly emptied it in one gulp. I'm off to the club, he casually remarked. He turned around and walked back to his car. Pressing the gas pedal to the floor, Paul drove back to the city. Although there was almost no joy left in his life, there was still one. Besides alcohol, Paul was also interested in gambling. He confidently drove towards his favorite club, where, in addition to drinks, one could play roulette. Fortunately, Paul's finances allowed him not to think about how much money he had already spent on such a lavish hobby. Today, luck will definitely be on my side, he thought challengingly. Whiskey. Paul shouted his order towards the waiter. And make it quick. Paul, can't you be a bit more polite? Adam, Paul's best and only serious friend, looked at him sternly. Although Adam had almost the same background, he significantly differed from Paul. From a young age, he learned from his father how to conduct business correctly and skillfully. Adam was just as wealthy as Paul and, of course, could afford not to work at all. However, wandering aimlessly through bars and clubs bored him. Adam liked it when his mind was active. With whom should I be polite? Him? Paul genuinely surprised. He's just a person, like you, Paul. Adam tossed a gambling chip. Say that to him. Why should I bow to him? Paul shrugged. He's no one special. He's just a person, like you. Be more straightforward, Paul, Adam repeated, throwing a gaming chip. Fine. Whatever. Today, I'll be nice. Paul took a sip from the already delivered glass. What's new? Not much, everything's the same. Planning to go out of town with Merrill, they say they've opened a fantastic hotel there. Paul grimaced. Out of town. Boring. You're boring. Nature, beauty. By the way, maybe you'll join us? I'll ask Meryl to bring her friend along. After all, you are. <laughs> looking for a wife. Get lost, Paul said irritably. Adam knew about Ms. Darcia's grand plan to marry Paul as soon as possible. There was a moment when Adam even participated in it. Ms. Darcia asked him to talk to Paul, to tell him about all the joys of family life and, in general, to guide him onto the right path. And since her plan had yet to materialize, Adam kept hearing from Paul how fed up he was with it all. Oh, come on, don't get all worked up. By the way, how's it going? How many brides have you checked out this month? Paul took a big gulp and gestured for the waiter to bring another glass. Oh, damn, I've lost count. It's physically impossible. You won't believe it, but just today there were two. Damn, two in one day. Just think about it. Mom has completely lost her mind. Well, she wants what's best. Don't be mad at her. Maybe it's really time for you to get married? You could take a closer look at the brides. See who you like, Adam suggested. Don't start, Adam. I've told you a long time ago that I'm not thinking about marriage, especially not with mom's girls. You've seen them. You're too harsh on them, Adam slapped Paul on the shoulder. So, are you coming with us? Should I ask Merrill to bring someone along? In general, Adam fully agreed with Ms. Darcia. He was convinced that a wedding would help Paul settle down and start living a normal life. He himself got married quite early, meeting a girl named Merrill at the age of 19, and by 22, they had already celebrated a lavish wedding. The only thing Adam disagreed with Paul's mom about was the choice of the bride. He believed that Paul should meet the right one himself. That's why he occasionally tried to introduce his friend to good girls. I don't know, Adam. Will Merrill's friend be more than just a stick figure? Paul asked. 
Adam laughed. Only if you look at her from very far away. The day of the trip arrived. Paul didn't want to go with his friends. He liked driving alone. And most importantly, in proud solitude. About an hour before his departure, he finally went to see his mother. He needed to apologize for his behavior. Losing money was not an option under any circumstances. As expected, Ms. Darcia forgave her wayward son. Paul told her about the upcoming trip and Meryl's mysterious friend. Paul, that's wonderful, his mother literally bloomed before his eyes. Do you know who her parents are? Ma, how would I know? Probably someone with money. You know Meryl, she won't be friends with just anyone. True. Well, go, my golden boy. I hope you'll like that girl. Well, mom. Paul approached his mother and hugged her. However things were, his mother loved him, and he probably loved her too. Well, go. I'll tell you everything when I get back. Just don't call. All right, all right. Before getting behind the wheel, Paul playfully winked at his mom in farewell. The trip promised to be long. Paul had been driving out of the city for a couple of hours already, and all around him were endless forests, fields, and occasional tiny villages. God, does anyone really live here? The guy snorted. All these tiny, miserable houses disgusted him. He checked the navigator. Yeah, about another hour. Well, what a wilderness. Adam probably wants to kill me there. The perfect place to disappear without a trace. He smiled at his silly thought and pressed the gas pedal with gusto. Some strange sound, what is it? Paul nervously listened, lowered the music. Something brightly flashed on the engine panel. Damn, the gearbox. Paul cursed and stopped the car. He turned off the engine and started it again. Maybe just a glitch in the electronics? He tried the operation one more time. The car did not respond. After all, the gearbox is done for. Damn it. What a jerk. Paul couldn't remember the name of the seller of this wonderful car. I hate it. He stepped outside, kicked the innocent foreign car's tire, lit a cigarette, and continued to curse. After standing for a while, running his hand through his well-groomed hair, he realized it was time to call for a tow truck. How long? Are you kidding me? Paul yelled so loudly that his own spit kept hitting the windshield. How many hours? What do you want me to do? Lie down here and die of boredom? I'm sorry, but it will take some time. You're very far away. We can arrange VIP taxi for you, the embarrassed operator tried to soften the situation. Then make it faster. Do you know who I am? Within half an hour, maximum. Sorry, Paul, but I can't influence that. Please understand. Paul didn't bother listening and hung up. He barely held back from throwing his, of course, expensive smartphone out the window. After sitting and cooling off a bit, he got out of the car and took a deep breath. Nothing else to do, I have to wait. He walked aimlessly at a leisurely pace. Along the road, on both sides, all that was visible was an endless majestic forest. There are no passing cars here. What a nightmare. Where did you want to take me, confess? Paul shouted into his phone. He called Adam to let him know that he probably wouldn't be able to make it on time. Paul, damn. You always manage to get into trouble and dive in head first. It's not my fault. It's this damn car. I didn't break it. Okay, don't freak out like that. Hang in there. Adam fell silent for a couple of seconds. There's a village literally a ten-minute walk from you. I checked on the map. And? Paul didn't understand the relevance of this information. So, go there. See how people live. It might be useful for you. Come on, forget it. I'm hanging up. Offended by his friend's lame joke, Paul ended the call and stuffed his phone into his jeans pocket. He wandered among tall dark spruces for a while and finally decided to venture into the village. 
he thought of it as some kind of excursion. Indeed, let's see how these folks live. Checking the map, he headed toward the village. The seemingly endless forest turned out to be just a small strip of woods. Beyond it, there was a pleasant view of golden boundless fields. Ugh. An unpleasant smell hit his nose, do the locals stink like this or what? Even though Paul was in complete solitude, he continued to shout curses. Perhaps, it was easier for him to cope with stress this way. Soon, the village appeared beyond the field. Small houses, like toy buildings, peeked out from the slope. Paul approached, the houses grew larger, and he could now distinguish the gray, weather-beaten roofs. However, some houses were quite decent. Apparently, there are differences even here, Paul thought, surprised. People appeared, noticeably different in Paul's opinion from those he was used to in the city, like humanoids differed from earthlings. He approached some wide gates. The flimsy doors were covered with light yellow peeling paint. Ha! <laughs> Just like in a loony bin. I wonder what these gates can protect from. Paul sincerely didn't understand why this village needed such protection. And what could they steal from them, cows and chickens? The gates indeed didn't inspire confidence. With some effort, one could easily jump over them in ten seconds. Paul continued to stand, probably near the main entrance. He didn't dare to enter the village. Who knows what's going on in the heads of these primitives. From somewhere, cheerful children's shouts and dog barks reached him. The thought of the unsanitary conditions in which these children were growing up made Paul cringe. In the distance, a lake was visible, and Paul realized that the children were probably yelling from there. He grimaced with disgust. How can they swim there? I can imagine the mud. He leisurely looked around. The hot day was coming to an end, but the June sun shone so brightly that it seemed Paul's skin would start melting any moment. Oh, to be in a cool car with air conditioning right now. The idea of plunging into the pond didn't seem so crazy anymore. Seven he took out his phone, checked the map. Yeah, somewhere around here, a supermarket, he tapped the smart screen, setting the desired point in the navigator, and headed towards the store. The thirst was tormenting him too much. He walked along birches and pines. There were other trees here, but he didn't know their names. Various smells reached him constantly. Sometimes it smelled sour, sometimes like animals, and sometimes, on the contrary, something sweet and intoxicating. Persistent insects swirled around, and Paul had already been bitten several times in different places. The bites itched terribly. Nausea crept up to Paul's throat now and then, but he persistently moved forward, recalling the neat territory of his mom's country house. Adam was right when he said it would be useful for Paul to see how villagers live. The small houses, crooked roofs, and low, dilapidated fences deeply impressed Paul. He would rather be at home or at least in some civilized place with a stronger drink in his hands. Suddenly, a sharp shout came from behind. Hey! And a loud click, as if cutting through the hot air. The man jumped in surprise. Come on, little one, don't lag behind. A young girl, who had quietly approached almost right next to him along the path, herded a huge spotted cow with a stick. In front of her, slightly to the side in the tall meadow grass, a whole herd of similar, but even larger cows, briskly trotted. The herd emitted a loud, menacing mooing. Well, well, little one. Paul was stunned by what he saw. In addition, wild fear overcame him. It was all unhygienic. And these animals, look how agile they are, they might attack. He panicked. Spun in place, trying to find a more advantageous position. In fact, he wanted to run away from here headlong, not bothering to figure out the way. But then his gaze fell on the herder herself, and he stopped in his tracks like he was rooted to the spot. Oh my, there was something to see here. The young, full-breasted, healthy-smelling girl bore no resemblance to a stick. Graceful movements, a light blush on her tanned, golden skin, elastic, long, chestnut braids rhythmically bounced, hitting her even, graceful back. Her long, light dress, resembling a nightshirt, fluttered in the light breeze, and Paul felt like he was watching some old movie about ancient Russia. 
The girl approached very close, but Paul had no intention of stepping back. He was no longer concerned about those cows that had initially frightened him. He just watched with fascination how easily and skillfully the girl led her herd. Seeing her up close, Paul realized that he had never met anyone more beautiful in his life. Young man, please step aside, she addressed him. A hot wave caught his breath, and he froze. He had never had problems with girls. Paul always thought that all the girls were crazy about him. Whether it was his appearance or his charm, something had a great influence on them. Or maybe it was his fat wallet. He preferred not to think about it. The girl, seemingly a simple shepherdess, but oh God, how beautiful. He continued to stand there, admiring her in awe. Hey, mister, she smiled broadly, revealing tiny and impeccably white teeth, please step aside, you're in our way. What? Oh, yes. Paul shifted slightly to the side. When the cow passed ahead and the girl came level with him, he mustered the courage to start a conversation. You are, you're so beautiful. What's your name? Thank you. She laughed melodiously. Her smile, plump pink lips, and long, dark, thick eyelashes struck Paul to the core. It seemed she didn't use any makeup. He was seeing a girl without makeup for the first time in his life and couldn't believe his eyes. Could they really be so seductive without a thousand different tricks? Please, answer my question. What's your name? Paul persistently repeated. Samantha, the shepherdess smiled, and you? Samantha, Paul repeated her name as if savoring it, what a beautiful name. And you are also very beautiful. I'm Paul. Pleasure to meet you, Paul. What brings you here? Did your car break down? Paul was surprised and blinked awkwardly. How did you know? She laughed in response. It's easy. There are no other options. I can see how you're dressed. Clearly, our village is a novelty for you. Probably drove by, hit all the potholes on our beautiful road, and there your car stalled. Now you're waiting for help. Am I right? Yes, Paul smiled, that's exactly what happened. But still, how did you? Paul felt a strange mix of emotions, shyness, curiosity, and a hint of excitement. He hadn't expected this encounter to unfold in such an unexpected and charming way. Great. I'll wait for you then. Here, take my number, and we can keep in touch, he said, handing her his phone with the number entry screen open. Samantha chuckled. City guy, always in a hurry, huh? Paul blushed a little and smiled awkwardly. Yeah, you got me there. She took the phone, entered her number, and handed it back to him. See you tomorrow, Paul. And don't worry, I won't stand you up, she said with a playful wink. As Samantha walked away, guiding the herd of cows along the trail, Paul couldn't help but watch her until she disappeared from view. The surroundings, which initially seemed like an inconvenience, now took on a different light. The rustling leaves, the scent of the fields, and the distant sounds of the countryside felt oddly soothing. Paul took a deep breath, realizing that this unexpected breakdown might have led him to a memorable encounter. He found a nearby rock, sat down, and couldn't help but smile at the unexpected turn of events. He decided to embrace the moment and appreciate the beauty of the countryside, at least until his car got fixed. Little did he know that this unplanned stop would mark the beginning of a unique chapter in his life, one filled with new experiences, genuine connections, and perhaps a touch of romance. She gave him another smile, laughed, and walked away. In a couple of minutes, the entire herd, along with the enchantress Samantha, disappeared behind the gates that Paul had recently mocked. Those gates turned out to be just a pen for large horned cattle, from which local villagers distributed their calves to homes. Paul watched her go, enchanted. Every move she made was so light, so airy, her gait, figure, facial features. She looked simply amazing. She was the kind of girl he had always dreamed of meeting. Paul, completely forgetting about his plans to go to the supermarket, desperately paced in place. He didn't want to stray too far from the village, he might miss Samantha. Looking around, a strange thought came to him. 
Some white flowers were growing nearby, perhaps chamomiles, albeit smaller, but they would do. He suddenly wanted to give her a bouquet. For the first time in his life, Paul was assembling a bouquet with his own hands. You're still here, Paul. It seems I've caught a persistent suitor, Samantha said, coming out of the cattle pen, laughing and giving Paul a sly look. He, who had been sitting in some joyful stupor on the grass, collecting flowers, quickly jumped to his feet, shook himself off, and handed Samantha the ready bouquet. Yes, I'm here. For you, Samantha, I'm ready for a lot, he blushed, thinking, God, what nonsense am I talking? Thank you, it's very beautiful. Daisies are my favorite flowers, she said, taking the bouquet and approaching Paul very closely. What a delightful aroma, he attempted to compliment her in the same way he often did with city girls, what perfume is this? I swear, the last Versace collection pales in comparison to this divine scent. Samantha laughed melodically. Versace perfume? I've never used any perfume in my life. Paul was greatly surprised. With all the girls he had known, they all wore perfume. Although he couldn't really distinguish the scents, he knew the brand names well. In principle, they all smelled the same, both the perfumes and the girls, luxurious and expensive. It turns out these expensive scents had already become quite tiresome for him. Samantha, on the other hand, smelled of something completely different, fresh, pleasant, and exciting. Does she really not use anything? So, this is how a real girl smells? Paul moaned softly with delight. Wanna take a stroll, he asked her pleadingly, show me the local beauties. Well, let's take a walk, Samantha replied, leading the way. Enchanted, Paul followed her like a child with a new toy, almost running behind her, trying not to stumble on the uneven, dusty road. They walked through the fields, admired the raspberry-colored sunset, chatting about everything and nothing along the way. Soon, they reached the village. Now, Paul didn't care where to go, as long as it was with her. Like an affectionate calf, he followed the girl, not paying much attention to the surroundings. Sometimes they stopped, and Samantha showed Paul some local landmarks. She even managed to convince him to swim in the local lake. Laughing infectiously, she calmly took off her light dress and remained in a thin linen slip with straps. Paul was completely captivated. Samantha's rounded forms, poorly concealed by the thin fabric, drove him mad. This is the kind of woman he needed, not some skinny, colorless hanger in his dear mommy's taste. Of course, he immediately followed her into the water. He would even jump into the fire if she were in danger. Despite having absolutely nothing in common, conversation topics still emerged, and they chatted away. They chatted and chatted, and the more time passed, the more Paul was convinced that he had fallen head over heels, smitten, infatuated, immersed, whatever they call it in movies, he didn't care. The main thing was that he had no intention of letting her go. And, it seemed, Samantha liked Paul too. Their date was interrupted by a phone call. Paul received a call informing him that the tow truck had arrived. He had no desire to leave Samantha, and as he bid her farewell, he intended to return to her as soon as he fixed or bought a car. Since their unexpected encounter, time seemed to slow down, and sometimes even reverse itself for Paul. He now felt like the happiest person on the planet. He felt like an enthusiastic teenager experiencing love and passion for the first time. Though it was too early, Paul visited Samantha every day. He insisted on renting an apartment for her in the city, very close to him, but Samantha modestly refused, as she did with particularly expensive gifts. Samantha was the only girl that not concerned his bank account. She loved him simply for being himself. At first, Paul couldn't believe that a woman could be indifferent to money and expensive gifts. However, he quickly realized that his beloved was fundamentally different from all the girls he had ever met. When Paul returned from his trip, as expected, Ms. Darcia literally clung to him. He didn't go into details, just mentioned that things with Merrill's friend worked out. Ms. Darcia was over the moon with joy. Paul knew that if his mom found out that Samantha was just a simple village shepherdess, she would be furious, and he would never see her money again. And now, he particularly needed it because he planned to give his beloved an entire world. And all his love on top of that. 
One day, Samantha finally agreed to spend the night at Paul's apartment. He brought her there and began showing her around. Wow, Samantha exclaimed in surprise, I'm afraid to touch anything here. Our whole village combined wouldn't cost as much as your kitchen. Don't be silly. If you want, you can break all the dishes, scatter things around the entire apartment. You'll do it, and I love everything you do, Paul replied, lifting her up. And never think about money, never. When we get married, you won't lack anything, absolutely anything. Married? Samantha looked into his eyes. Of course, he said, placing her on the floor and kneeling on one knee. Will you marry me? Tears of joy welled up in her eyes. Yes, of course, yes. She pulled him up by his hands, embracing him. I am the luckiest man on earth, he declared, gently kissing her. Now, let's have a drink. What would you like? Paul headed to his bar. Paul, Samantha's face became serious like never before. She approached him and took his hand reaching for the bottle. Paul, Paul, no. What's wrong, sunshine, he smiled. Don't you want to celebrate our engagement? I will never drink alcohol in my life, her expression changed. And my husband will never be a drinker. She turned around and walked through the room. What's the big deal? During all the time Paul was with Samantha, he hardly drank at all. Perhaps he felt self-conscious being drunk around her. Besides, he was always behind the wheel, although it never bothered him before. Now, he started worrying about his life and, especially, about the life of his beloved. But this was such a reason to celebrate. He set aside the glass and approached Samantha. What's wrong, my love? Paul took her hand and looked into her eyes. My father, he drank a lot, terribly. He died when I was fourteen. He died from that poison. That's when I promised myself never to touch alcohol and never to associate with those who drink. The girl's lips trembled, her hands became as cold as ice, and tears glistened in her eyes. I didn't know, sunshine. I had no idea. Yes, of course. And I didn't know you had a whole bar here. I'm sorry, but if you start drinking, I won't be able to be with you. Don't say another word. Paul jumped to his feet, approached the bar, and began pouring all its contents into the sink. Paul loved to drink, but now, even more than alcohol, more than roulette, expensive cars, and all his other life, he loved her, Samantha. Alcohol was no longer needed, as he was now happy without it. I love you. Samantha approached him from behind, hugged him from behind, and pressed her whole body against him. He turned around, kissed her gently, and, lifting her in his arms, carried her to the bedroom. Paul stopped drinking. He hadn't had a drop for several months. Not a gram at all. His face rejuvenated, and there was no trace of the protruding belly. He spent less money, as gambling no longer interested him either. With Samantha, he was happier than ever. And at some point, he made an important decision for himself to start participating in the family business. Ms. Darcia was ecstatic. Mommy, this is for you. Paul, who had come to his mother, handed her a huge bouquet of various wildflowers. My golden boy, thank you. She took the bouquet and inhaled its scent. Looking at you is such a pleasure. How you've blossomed. Thank you. It's all because of her. Paul, when are you going to introduce us? Ms. Darcia's voice rose. She was overjoyed with what was happening. Who is she? Who are her parents? What business are they in? Tell me something about her already. At least something. She. Paul paused mid-sentence. He knew very well that Ms. Darcia would never approve of this marriage. Paul, if you don't tell me, I'll ask Merrill, his mother insinuated. No, Paul began to panic, she, she's the daughter of bankers. He blurted out the first thing that came to mind. Bankers. Ms. Darcia handed the bouquet to Bill, who was standing nearby. Understanding her without words, he went to put the flowers in a vase. She sat at the table and gestured with her hand for her son to sit opposite her. 
Owners of banks, right? That's good. Can I meet them? Unlikely, mom. They're from another city. Paul sat down and picked up a glass of orange juice from the table. I'll introduce you to them for sure. By the way, I propose to her. We'll get married soon. Oh my god, Paul. Ms. Darcia clapped her hands, what happiness. She stood up from the table and, ignoring etiquette, embraced her son tightly. Let's have some champagne. No, mom, he smiled, I don't drink anymore. Ms. Darcia was speechless. Everything she had dreamed of had finally come true. Somehow, Paul had become exactly the person she had envisioned only in her dreams. Paul and Samantha sat in the spacious hall. Paul had rented it for the whole day because he had come up with a brilliant plan. Samantha looked at him. She didn't particularly like all this. Are you sure this is necessary? she asked anxiously. Maybe we should move to my village? I don't need all this luxurious life. Samantha, he gently nudged her, look at yourself. You must shine. You know, mom will go crazy if she finds out you're from the village. Please, endure it for me. Oh, okay. Samantha reached for him and kissed him on the cheek. Meanwhile, unfamiliar people entered the hall, a couple, a man, and a woman. Paul's brilliant plan was to stage a performance in front of his mother. He had already rented a luxurious and spacious house, bought Samantha fancy designer outfits. The only thing left to do was to hire actors for the role of the bride's parents. Essentially, their presence was only needed twice, during the introduction to his mom and at the actual wedding. He rented the hall and announced a casting for this slightly unusual role. Not right away, Paul exclaimed to this not-so-young woman with eyes as black as night, you don't even look alike. Right, Samantha? Samantha remained silent. Darling, it's up to you. I don't know what kind of people your mom might like. Choose for yourself. Next. Summer was coming to an end, the actors were hired, and Samantha was coached so well that no one would ever think this girl was born and raised in a small village, not in a luxurious house full of servants. Paul carefully inspected the house he had rented, ran the hired actors through their roles for the tenth time. Everything seemed perfectly prepared to him. The doorbell rang. On the spacious screen of the surveillance camera hanging on the house gate, Paul saw Ms. Darcia. She was dressed in a black, strict floor-length dress, impeccably matched jewelry, a luxurious sable coat, and in her hand, a holder with a delicate, elegant cigarette. Her short and voluminous silver hair was styled, as always, in a perfect hairstyle. Above her thin, red lips, there was an elegant black mole. Paul never understood why his mom's makeup artists painted over it throughout his childhood. Bill, her faithful companion, stood by her side, as always. Is that your mom? She's so. Samantha quietly approached from behind and clapped her hands with wide-eyed amazement. Paul tightly clenched his jaw out of tension. Showing off, huh? Don't worry, my dear, we've prepared well. Paul pressed a button and opened the gate. What a magnificent house, Ms. Darcia spun in place with a raised hand, you know, taste is either there or it's not. You, dear, have excellent taste. Thank you, the actress hired to play Samantha's mom smiled discreetly, Ms. Darcia, please understand me correctly, but marriage is a serious matter. We need to make sure that your family has the status we require. Tell us about yourselves. Paul smirked slyly, turning away and winking at Samantha. The actress, as planned, went on the offensive. He knew his mom well and understood how to impress her. Ms. Darcia beamed with a smile. She felt right at home in such conversations. The pseudo family sat down at a long table. The meeting went perfectly. Ms. Darcia shared everything she deemed necessary. Samantha's pseudo parents, in turn, smoothly recounted all the details of their pseudo life that they had rehearsed with Paul for days. Preparations for the wedding were in full swing. Paul entrusted Samantha with everything. He liked her simple yet excellent taste. The only problem was Ms. Darcia, demanding refined style and luxury. But overall, everything was going so smoothly that Paul couldn't shake the feeling that something had to go wrong. 
Ms. Darcia sat in her favorite inner courtyard, surrounded by greenery, flipping through some magazine. Suddenly, Bill, slightly flustered, appeared before her. Ms. Darcia, someone has come to see you. Who? She put the magazine aside and looked at her assistant questioningly. I'm not expecting anyone. It's Meryl, Adam's wife, with some girl. Bill looked lost. What do you mean, some girl? Probably Samantha. What's gotten into you? Have you completely lost your memory? That's the thing, I haven't. I'm seeing this girl for the first time. You definitely don't know her either. Meryl said she wants to introduce you to her. Why? I don't understand a thing. Well, bring them here. The woman looked puzzled. It had been half a year since she forgot about all these young girls. She didn't need it because Paul had a fiancé. Ms. Darcia, Meryl walked into the garden, nice to see you. Meet Gina. Next to Meryl stood a tall, slender girl. If this introduction happened a bit earlier, Ms. Darcia would have been delighted. But now. Yes, she didn't particularly like Samantha externally, finding her a bit too plump and simple, but look at her family. Nice to meet you, Ms. Darcia. Meryl. Likewise. She cringed. By what fate? What do you mean? Meryl and Gina sat down together. We came to get acquainted. I mean you and Gina, Meryl clarified, Paul still hasn't come. How long can we wait? Yes, I heard about his simpleton girlfriend, but you must agree, she's not at all his match. And Gina is suitable for your son. She herself has been looking for a worthy match for a long time. Ms. Darcia's eyes widened. What a simpleton. Meryl rolled her eyes. Oh, perhaps you're not in the know. Of course, he was shy to introduce you to her. Paul met some village girl that day when we went to the village. He still hasn't come to us. Personally, I haven't even seen her. But Adam said that Paul fell in love. Meryl paused expectantly, but the hostess seemed to have lost the power of speech. Yes, Adam certainly thinks that status is not the main thing, but you should understand, Meryl spoke again. And he'll get tired of her soon. But Gina, Gina is quite worthy of your Paul. I don't understand anything. Ms. Darcia rolled her eyes. Samantha is my Paul's fiancé, a beautiful girl, with a worthy family. She shifted her gaze to Gina. Gina, you are pure charm, but my Paul is already taken. Honestly, I like you much more than Samantha, but you can't command the heart. Meryl burst into laughter. Ha! <laughs> ha! And did you, one of the smartest women I know, believe in that? Samantha is a shepherdess. I don't know what they told you, but all of it is not true. It's time for you to open your eyes and drive away this imposter. She only wants his money. How do you not understand? A vague suspicion pricked in Ms. Darcia's heart. What are you talking about, Meryl? Suddenly she got angry, refusing to believe in words that so inconveniently shattered her fragile long-awaited happiness. It was nice to see you, dear ladies, but it's time for you to go. Bill, escort the young ladies. Ms. Darcia took the magazine back in her hands. Is that so? Ms. Darcia, you are mistaken. Well, it's your right. Gina, let's go. We'll find you a better groom. Meryl jumped to her feet, grabbed her silent friend by the arm, and proudly walked towards the exit. Bill, don't bother escorting. And the girls left the garden. What was that? The bewildered Miss Darcia turned to Bill. I don't know, Bill pondered, to be honest, the day I met the family seemed a bit strange. What do you mean? Well, let's say, everything went as if scripted. Bill decided to cautiously sit next to the hostess. I don't want to speak ill of Paul, you know how much I love him. And Samantha is the sweetest girl. But something, something seems off. Honestly, I'm worried about Paul. What if he gets into something? What if our Samantha turns out to be a scammer? Do you think so? Ms. Darcia paled from anxiety. You know, Bill, it seemed that way to me too. 
Everything went too perfectly. And Merrill said that Paul never came to them. Who is this Gina? Paul said that Samantha is Merrill's friend. Someone is definitely lying. We just need to find out who, Bill continued for Ms. Darcia. Samantha twirled in front of the mirror. The wedding was coming soon, and there was still so much to prepare. And here Samantha, instead of choosing flowers for the banquet, was choosing the right dress for a meeting with her future mother-in-law, who wanted to talk to her face to face. Samantha was alone in the apartment. Paul had been fully immersed in family business for several months now. Samantha was glad that he was involved in a good and worthwhile venture. She fastened a golden earring, inspected herself once again, and called a taxi. Some ugly, unpleasant feeling firmly settled in the girl's chest. Ms. Darcia, did you want to see me? A little nervously, Samantha walked into the house. She smiled politely at Bill and sat on the chair offered to her. I wanted to, Samantha. Well, how are you? How is the wedding preparation? Ms. Darcia stared at the future bride. Everything is good, thank you. Samantha carefully took the coffee Bill had brought. I wanted to ask you something. Show me the guest list. Your family is originally from New York, right? There should be many guests from there. And I have many friends from there. I'm sure I'll see familiar faces. Samantha felt a chill. Her hands trembled. She took a deep breath, pretended to have sipped too hot coffee, and thus tried to hide her trembling. The list is not ready yet. We forget about the list. Just tell me about a couple of families. Honestly, I know many people. Tell me, will the briefs be there? Samantha, still with disobedient hands, placed the coffee cup on the saucer. Ms. Darcia's gaze immediately fell on her hands. Anxious. That's the ticket. I'll expose her now, thought Paul's mother. The briefs? Yes, they will be there, the nervous Samantha answered as her beloved had taught her. When in doubt, agree with everything. Wonderful. Ms. Darcia smiled. Their jewelry business must be bringing in good income. I think you're right. Their jewelry is simply marvelous. Samantha swallowed nervously. As soon as the list is ready, I'll make sure to send it to you. Good girl. That's all I wanted. I won't keep you any longer. You still have so much to do. Ms. Darcia stood up from the table. Thank you for inviting me. Samantha nodded, got up, and headed towards the door. Goodbye, Ms. Darcia. Good luck, dear. She smirked, and a chill ran down Samantha's spine. The gates closed. Bill returned to Ms. Darcia's company. Am I correct in understanding that there are no briefs? He cautiously inquired. You always understood me, Bill. Always. I don't know what I'll do with that brazen, disgusting girl, but I'll destroy her, that's for sure. Ms. Darcia's eyes flashed with anger. Bill, standing nearby, shivered in horror. He knew the mistress well. Poor, poor girl. Several days passed. Samantha told her fiancé about what had happened, but he nervously waved it off. We'll figure it out, don't worry, sweetheart. She has plenty of acquaintances. On the wedding day, she'll forget about the Breves family. Everything will be fine. Samantha couldn't help but feel nervous, but wedding preparations consumed her entirely. On that fateful day, she stood in the restaurant, booking it for the wedding banquet. A buzz from her phone interrupted her conversation with the manager. It was a text message. Darling, it's me. I've booked a room at the Gold Hotel for today. Don't ask anything, come exactly at 9 p.m. It's a surprise. Love you. The message came from an unknown number, and Samantha wondered. Has he broken his phone again, clumsy as he is? Smiling at her own thoughts, she gently placed her phone in her beige handbag. I wonder what he came up with. At the same moment, while Paul was talking to the manager of one of their cinemas with his mother, he also received an unexpected text message, just like Samantha. 
Dear, it's me, Samantha. I want to give you a surprise. Come to the Gold Hotel today at exactly 9.20 p.m. Don't be late. Love you. The number was unfamiliar, and Paul felt that something was amiss. Why isn't she writing from her own phone? Mr. Paul, the manager's voice pulled Paul out of his thoughts. Paul didn't bother with it, who knows what it could be. Tucking away his phone, he followed the employee. A taxi stopped near the Gold Hotel. Samantha gracefully stepped out of the back seat and looked around. Wow. This is something. What beauty, Samantha exclaimed. She had only seen this hotel in pictures before. With a graceful stride, she headed straight inside. The clicking of her heels echoed through the marble lobby. Hello, there should be a room reserved under the name Adkins, Samantha said. The hotel employee smiled widely and clicked the computer mouse. Good evening, everything is in order. They will guide you now. After a couple of seconds, a young and handsome guy appeared. He was also a hotel staff member. He politely smiled at Samantha and gestured for her to follow him. As the girl rode the elevator, she speculated about what interesting thing her beloved had come up with this time. The elevator door opened, and the hotel employee handed Samantha the key card, pointing to her desired room. Paul, are you here? Samantha closed the door behind her carefully. It seemed that no one was in the room. She checked the time, the clock showed 9.10 p.m. Strange. Paul never arrives late to meet her. She turned on the light and gasped. The room was covered with rose petals, there was a tray of fruits on the bar counter, next to it was a bottle of champagne and two glasses. Samantha frowned. Probably non-alcoholic. She approached, took the bottle, and turned it around to face herself. Alcoholic, what the? She didn't have time to continue her thought as the door behind her swung open. Samantha, darling, hello. A somewhat smug guy entered the room. Samantha saw him for the first time. She recoiled in fear. Who are you? You've got the wrong room. No mistake. The guy began to approach, creeping up to her like a tiger. Frightened, Samantha stepped back, her eyes searching for something to defend herself. Don't come any closer. She grabbed onto something, and an ugly hole formed in her thin knitted dress, sweater. I'm your favorite, remember? The guy grinned and circled around her, greedily smiling. For some reason, he kept glancing at his watch. What nonsense are you talking about? Get out of here. Samantha threw an orange at him. The cheeky guy skillfully dodged it, looked at his watch again, and did something strange. He took out a pink lipstick from his pocket, the same one Samantha liked to wear on her lips, and drew a line on his neck. Then he smeared it, creating the impression that someone had passionately kissed him not long ago. Horror froze in Samantha's eyes. What are you doing? You'll find out soon. He looked at the watch again. Embarrassed, Samantha reflexively glanced at her watch too. The time was 9.19 p.m. Footsteps and the sound of the door handle being opened could be heard outside. The guy then pounced on her like a predator on prey and knocked her down onto the nearby couch. Samantha felt like she lost consciousness for a couple of long seconds. Samantha. What the hell? At that very moment, Paul entered the room. The sight before him literally made his heart stop. Right on the couch, his fiance was writhing with some jerk. He surveyed the room. They're even drinking. She lied. She had been lying all the time. Without saying a word, Paul turned and rushed out of the room. He ran downstairs and almost smashed the glass doors with a sharp push. He sat in his car and burst into tears like a little boy. He had never felt so much pain and discomfort before. Ms. Darcia sipped on her brandy in the small living room. She smirked while looking at the antique clocks hanging on the wall. Now, now he'll understand what a fool he's been. Well, Paul will get through this. Ms. Darcia, Bill, standing nearby, cleared his throat, don't you think this is going too far? Don't lecture me, she waved her hand at him, I didn't need your moralizing. 
Sometimes you act like a mother, I swear. Bill lowered his gaze awkwardly. I'm sorry. Maybe I went too far, she calmly took another sip from her glass, but admit it, this girl is up to something. I did everything right. Everything is right. Everything. I don't want to hear anything. Refresh. She handed her assistant an empty glass. Let me go, you monster. Samantha struggled with all her might to break free from the grip of the unknown man. She kicked, pushed, and did everything she could to get him off her. After Paul left, the guy released Samantha and stepped back a few paces. What was that? Oh, God. Paul. Tears poured like a river from her blue eyes. It seemed she realized that she had been maliciously set up. But by whom? You have a message from Ms. Darcia. The scoundrel, already standing in the doorway, spoke up. So that you don't get close to Paul anymore. I see through village chicks like you. Forget about him and find yourself another fool. The guy fell silent and looked at Samantha with a more thoughtful gaze. Nothing personal, sweetheart, and he shrugged. The door slammed behind him. Samantha burst into even louder sobs. From the emotional pain she felt, she screamed as much as she could. Why? What have I done? She repeated these words over and over, sobbing and smearing tears on her cheeks. With trembling hands, she grabbed her phone, dialed Paul's number, but heard only long beeps. Go to hell, you slut, finally roared her most beloved person into the phone. Paul, I've been set up, Samantha hurriedly said, I didn't. Short beeps were heard in the receiver. She dialed the number again and again, but now the subscriber was unavailable. Weakened, she slid down the wall. One question still echoed in her head, why? She already knew that Paul's mother orchestrated everything, but why? Evidently, she somehow found out that Samantha wasn't wealthy at all, but why act so cruelly? She decided to ask this question directly to Ms. Darcia. She dialed her number. Hello, the calm voice of the almost mother-in-law greeted. Paul said you're cruel, but to this extent? You're not only doing harm to me, but to him too. Why? The voice on the other end laughed. Ha! Ha! Trust me, dear, my Paul has had so many like you that you can't even imagine. He'll forget about you by tomorrow, or maybe he already has. And you won't see any of his money. If you want a lot of money, earn it yourself. What money, what are you talking about? We love each other. Oh, spare me your fairy tales. Love, love, love. There was no love between you two. And if it makes you feel better, Paul wasn't faithful to you. Think he was working? What a joke. He fooled around with girls like you, ragged ones. But it's okay, I've already found a fiancé worthy of him. They have a date tomorrow. And you, disappear. Ms. Darcia hung up. Of course, she was lying, and Samantha understood that. But her words cut so deeply into her heart that the girl had no strength left to argue or prove anything. Moreover, Samantha perfectly understood that she couldn't win in a confrontation with this woman. Paul was right, his mother was a real piece of work. She dropped the phone, stared blankly at the ceiling. There was no energy left for a tantrum. Nor were there any emotions. Just a ringing emptiness inside. Paul pressed the gas pedal. He didn't know where he was going. And after the amount of brandy he had consumed the night before, he couldn't think straight at all. Sure, Paul had driven drunk many times before and even got into accidents, but a couple of calls and some bills slipped to the traffic cop always solved all the problems. But as drunk as he was now, Paul had never sat behind the wheel. He drove as fast as the latest car allowed him. An empty brandy bottle lay somewhere at his feet. Completely letting go of the wheel, he reached for another. Life seemed shattered to him. He saw no point in continuing it. Paul didn't even think about who sent that unfortunate text message. He just sped along the nighttime road, heading towards a place where his soul wouldn't hurt as much. Approaching the traffic light at the intersection, Paul saw the red light, but he didn't care. 
Ignoring the blaring horns of protesting cars, he raced forward. A bright flash lit up to his right. He turned his head, thinking he saw his fiancée. Samantha. The last thing Paul remembered was a strong impact, the screech of brakes, shattering glass, and a bright white light. Paul, Paul, you woke up. Ms. Darcia jumped from the chair next to the hospital bed. Mom, where am I? What happened to me? Where's Samantha? Ms. Darcia's eyes widened. Paul, you had an accident, an accident because of her. Don't you dare even utter the name of that lying bitch again. Because of her. Paul closed his eyes and tried to remember. Memories began to appear in his head like bright flashes. There he enters the room and sees Samantha in the embrace of some man. There he, drunk in a hurricane, races through a red light. Where is she? Is she okay? He uttered with difficulty. She's perfectly fine, Miss Darcia's nostrils flared with indignation, I don't know where she is. Probably ran off somewhere with her lover or found another rich idiot. Paul frowned and tried to concentrate, looking into his mother's eyes. Lover? Mom, do you know? That Samantha of yours, a pauper? Of course, I know. And well, let it be if she suits your taste, but infidelity. Are you ready to forgive infidelity? Paul fell silent. He looked at his suspended leg in front of him. A cast was on his neck. His body ached with pain. Probably, he had broken ribs. Suddenly, he groaned with the realization of a simple fact. Mom, who sent the SMS? Ms. Darcia fell silent. She blinked her mascara-coated eyelashes. What SMS? Who sent the text message? Paul repeated firmly, wincing from the pain caused by these words. Paul, my golden boy, what does it matter? You finally learned the truth about her. Thank the person who sent the SMS. How did you find out she was there with a lover? Paul looked at his mother seriously, almost accusingly. Ms. Darcia, always calm and composed, began to visibly fidget. She attempted to respond, but her thin lips moved soundlessly. You sent it, didn't you? Was it your actor? There was no lover. Paul, don't talk nonsense. You probably have a fever. She approached, gently touched her son's forehead. Definitely a fever. We need a nurse. She paced around the room. Why are you saying such things? How can you say that? Paul no longer listened to her. His mother's voice had become nothing more than an annoying, unpleasant noise to him. He closed his eyes. From that moment, he decided that he would never talk to his mother again. Over a year had passed since that dreadful accident. Initially, Paul completely ignored his mother but still lived with her. He had stopped leaving the house altogether. Even gambling no longer interested him. He had also forgotten about his cars. Occasionally, he would leave his room, silently take a taxi to see his doctor. One day, Ms. Darcia realized that something terrible was happening. She sent the cleaner to thoroughly search his room for something that could explain such behavior. The worried mother stood helplessly, biting her lip until it almost bled, in the middle of the luxurious kitchen. Finally, the cleaner entered the kitchen. I found something. What? Give it to me. Ms. Darcia rushed to the girl. I don't know, some pills. She hesitantly extended her hand with the pill bottle. Ms. Darcia snatched the pill box, twisted it in her hands, opened it, sniffed, closed it, and finally read the label. Oh God. The bottle slipped from her hands. After the accident, Paul was prescribed strong painkillers. Initially, he took them as prescribed, but then. Then he started taking them to numb himself. For several months now, Paul had been heavily relying on strong painkillers. Bill, what's the status? Ms. Darcia nervously bit her lip. Just a moment, I need more time. Bill was sitting at the computer. Ms. Darcia and Bill had been sitting in her office for a solid hour. Well, we can't wait forever. So, where is he? 
Bill quickly typed on the keyboard, looked up at the monitor, then pressed something again. Found him. Here he is. Let's go. Ms. Darcia was already standing in the doorway. After finding the pills, she created a big scandal. The doctor who had been quietly selling medications without prescribing them to her only son was sent to prison amidst a big scandal. Paul, as usual, didn't say a word, even when he found out that the pills were no longer available. He just started leaving home more often. At first, he would go somewhere for a couple of hours, then he wouldn't be home for the whole day, and later. Later, he would disappear for days and weeks. Ms. Darcia sounded the alarm. Together with Bill, they tracked his location using his mobile phone and were now speeding through the crowded city streets. We've arrived. Bill, undoing his seatbelt, looked at Ms. Darcia. Are you ready? I'm ready for anything. She continued to stare blankly into the distance. Their car reached the outskirts of the city. Paul's location suggested he should be in this rundown three story building. Let's go then. They got out of the car and headed towards the building. The entrance to the last block was open. The precise geolocation indicated they needed to go up to the third floor and move a bit to the right. Soon, they saw an open door leading to some dark apartment building. They exchanged glances. Overwhelmed by approaching fear, the convinced atheist Ms. Darcia crossed herself. They stepped into the open apartment. From somewhere inside, there was terrifying, nerve-wracking music. Paul, Paul, my son. Ms. Darcia rushed to Paul lying on the floor. He lay face down on a dirty rag. Several people of horrifying appearance lay motionless around him, but she couldn't care less about them. Paul, wake up, please. She shook her son, tears spraying from her eyes, and the woman couldn't hold back, wailing loudly. Why are you standing? Help me turn him over. Dumbfounded, Bill immediately rushed to help. He sat in front of Paul, turned him onto his back, and checked for a pulse. He's alive. Thank God. Ms. Darcia cried, burying her face in her son's chest. Call an ambulance. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Just want to get home. Mr. Paul's voice was flat, devoid of any emotion. The journey back home was silent, and Ms. Darcia attempted a few more times to engage her son in conversation, but he remained unresponsive, gazing out the window as if the world beyond held little interest for him. When they reached the house, Bill helped Mr. Paul out of the car. His once confident stature had transformed into a hesitant, stumbling gait. The visible change in Paul's physical condition tugged at Ms. Darcia's heart, but she was determined to put on a brave face. Welcome home, Paul. Let's make this a fresh start. You have our full support, Bill said, trying to inject some positivity into the atmosphere. Mr. Paul gave a nod, acknowledging Bill's words but not offering any response. The house that had once been filled with the echoes of laughter and joy now seemed silent and heavy with unspoken pain. In the days that followed, Ms. Darcia tried to rebuild a sense of normalcy. She arranged for various therapists and support groups to assist Paul in his recovery. However, the once vibrant young man seemed like a mere shadow of his former self. Mr. Paul spent most of his time in isolation, avoiding any form of interaction. His mother, torn between guilt and the desire to mend their relationship, struggled to bridge the emotional chasm that had grown between them. One day, as she entered Paul's room, she found him staring blankly at the wall. His eyes, once filled with determination, now mirrored a profound emptiness. Paul, we need to talk, Ms. Darcia began tentatively. He remained silent, not lifting his gaze. I know I made mistakes, terrible mistakes. I understand if you can't forgive me, but we can't go on like this. I want to help you. I want us to find a way to move forward together. Mr. Paul finally turned his eyes toward his mother. The silent pain in his gaze spoke volumes, revealing the wounds that had yet to heal. I don't know if we can ever go back to the way things were, Mom. But we can try to find a new way, a different path, he said quietly. The journey toward healing and reconciliation would be arduous, but in that moment, a glimmer of hope emerged. Ms. Darcia realized that, 
no matter how broken their past, there was still a chance to rebuild and redefine their relationship. It would take time, effort, and understanding, but perhaps a new beginning awaited them. Okay. Paul continued to stare out of the window. Paul, the mother persisted, tell me, what can I do for you? Come on, tell me. Paul slowly turned his head away from the window and stared at his mother. He hesitated for a moment, fidgeted, and finally spoke. Mom, where are we going? My golden boy, you're talking to me. The woman smiled. She tried to hug her son again, but he gestured that she shouldn't. Where are we going? Of course, home. And what would you like to do? Maybe you want to play roulette? Of course, she didn't like her son's pastime with gambling, but it was better than drugs. The woman literally chose the lesser of two evils. Oh, come on, I don't want to. Mom, you, you have. He hesitated to say something. What, son? What, just say it. You know, I'll do anything for you. Mom, give me some money. Ms. Darcia fell silent. She returned to her seat, stared at the road for a long time, then glanced at Bill. Unnoticed by Paul sitting behind, Bill shook his head. Why do you need money? The woman said slowly. If I ask, then I must need it. Paul squirmed in the passenger seat. I owe Adam. I borrowed from him. If you don't want to give, then I'll stop talking to you again. And he, like a little offended child, turned back to the window. If you owe, I can repay him myself. The woman hesitated. No, you don't understand, he shouted, it's a matter of honor. Will you give it or not? Well. Ms. Darcia glanced at her assistant once again. He silently mouthed the word no. She remained silent for a long time, then turned to her son again. Do you promise not to ignore me anymore? He smiled, nodded happily. Sure, I just need at least fifty thousand. For now. And drop me off somewhere. Right here is fine. Ms. Darcia hesitated, then reluctantly reached into her wallet. How much do you owe him? Maybe I can take you to his house? Whose? Paul blinked in confusion. Adam's house. You owe him, don't you? So, how much? Oh, yeah, I owe him. Just give me the card and cash. I'll handle it myself. I'll get there on my own. Everything will be fine, Mom. Paul's eyes lit up. Okay, the woman handed her son a few bills and her card. Bill, let's go. Bill, stop. Bill hesitantly glanced at his boss. His eyes screamed that she was making a big mistake. Stop, Bill. The car came to a halt. Paul awkwardly got out and limped away. Why are you looking at me like that? The woman shouted. Tears welled up in her throat. What was I supposed to do? Not give him money? At least he spoke to me. Dropping her head into her hands, she burst into tears. Bill continued to stare at the spot where Paul had sat just moments ago. Ms. Darcia's desperate cry brought tears to his eyes as well. Ms. Darcia, never trust an addict. Never. He whispered these words and gently took the hostess by the hand. She shook off Bill's hand and screamed with all her might. Paul is not a drug addict. Since Paul left the car, he never showed up at home. He also didn't appear at Adam's place. A week later, Ms. Darcia, together with her assistant, found him unconscious in the same den. Time passed. With each passing day, the life of the Adkins family got worse and worse. The mother lived according to her now habitual schedule, finding her son unconscious, sending him for treatment, bringing him back, and starting all over again. She extracted him from absolutely terrifying and dreadful dens, scratching him out of places that were beyond imagination. Paul firmly and definitively succumbed to the needle. Ms. Darcia tried everything imaginable. She sent him to expensive rehabilitation centers far away, abroad, by the seaside. 
she sent him to free clinics, took him to specialized centers associated with every conceivable and inconceivable denomination. Nothing helped. He went through treatment, came out, swore that he would never again, and then relapsed. Which doctor's charms were of no use, even hypnosis failed. Strict bans on cash and bank cards didn't help either. He still managed to find new and new doses. Acquaintances and friends just shrugged their shoulders. They came to her home with forced sad faces, sympathized with her, offered help, but there was no genuine concern in their actions. For a once active and lively woman, her hands were almost hanging down. However, there were good days, or rather, they were considered good by Ms. Darcia. She deemed those rare moments when Paul, returning from treatment, spent the first couple of days at home. Once, during such a period, Adam and Merrill came to visit them. Ms. Darcia, dear, how are you? Merrill squeezed out the most charming smile. She approached the exhausted woman and took her hands. Merrill, for God's sake, wipe that smile off your face. The woman pushed her away. Lately, this affected sympathy only irritated her. Of course, of course. The girl took a seat opposite. Dear, please understand. I wish neither harm to you nor Paul. I just want to give you some advice. Do you really think advice will help me? Why did you come? Adam? Adam, standing in the doorway, looked up. I want to talk to Paul. Where is he? In his room. Ms. Darcia sighed heavily. Go, go up to him. He's unlikely to come down on his own. Adam ascended the spiral staircase. Merrill watched him go and, once he disappeared on the second floor, spoke up. Ms. Darcia, it's time for you to understand one thing. She spoke slowly, with a hint of arrogance in her voice. There's no helping Paul anymore, don't waste your energy on him. Let him go. Addicts are like that. How dare you? Out of indignation, the woman spoke with her former authoritative voice. Paul is not an addict. Sweet Miss Darcia, don't deceive yourself. Leave Paul, live your life. You're not a girl anymore, take care of yourself. He's beyond salvation. Ms. Darcia boiled with rage. How dare you? Get out of here. Merrill smiled, got up, and left the house. Ms. Darcia felt like she was running out of air. She went into the yard and accidentally overheard her son's conversation with his friend. They were on the balcony one floor above. Paul, look at what you're turning your life into. How can this happen? Tell me, is it all because of her? Ms. Darcia listened intently. I don't know anymore, Adam, I don't know. Do you think I enjoy this kind of life? Look at me. I'm disabled, I don't know how to go on. And I don't want to. The days I spent with Samantha were the best in my life. Paul's voice sounded weak and muffled. Although Ms. Darcia couldn't see him, she could vividly imagine the expression on his face. The woman's heart constricted with pain. Why not go back? Let me go to her, explain everything. She loved you, she can help you. Don't you dare, Paul raised his voice, don't you dare touch her. Let her live peacefully. Without a monster like me. I know my mother orchestrated all of this. My own mother. Maybe I'm just like her. A moral monster. Samantha doesn't need such a family. And what business is it of yours anyway? Leave me alone, all of you. Silence fell. Ms. Darcia covered her face with her hands. It was hard for her to breathe. I won't abandon you, Paul. You're my best friend. I know Merrill is partly to blame for this. It was she who told your mother that Samantha is from the village. I don't care who told her. I don't care anymore. Leave me alone and don't dare to approach her. The balcony door made a mournful clink and Ms. Darcia heard Adam's heavy sigh. She hurried back into the house. Adam, the woman waited until he descended the stairs and grabbed his hand, where can I find Samantha? How are you? Why do you need her? 
I wanted to find her, but Paul is strongly against it. Why? What if she can forgive me, what if she can help Paul? I'm ready to accept her, ready. I cursed the day I decided on such treachery. And why did I meddle in their lives? Ms. Darcia let go of Adam's hand and clutched her head. Don't blame yourself too much. Think about your health. He glanced around and lowered his voice. I'll give you the address of that village, just don't tell Paul it was me. I swear I won't tell. Thank you, thank you. Hope lit up in her eyes. You know, you were right. Adam looked at his friend's mother with surprise. Status, money, she continued, it all means nothing. But you're Meryl, talk to her. She's allowing herself too much. Meryl, Adam pronounced her name with some disappointment, she has become completely different from the beginning of our marriage. Yes, she's beautiful, but behind that beauty, there's some dark soul. But why don't you divorce her? Ms. Darcia gasped. She had always held Meryl and Adam up as an example for Paul. Both rich, both from good families. Why? Children, our business. Everything is joint. Besides, our parents won't approve of the divorce. He sighed heavily. It was good to see you, Ms. Darcia. I hope everything works out for you. He turned around and left the house. The woman pondered. Perhaps, in family life, the most important thing is not money or social status. Maybe all people, regardless of where they come from or who their parents are, have the right to freely determine their destinies. She thought about how Paul's life would have turned out if she hadn't intervened so rudely. A picture immediately formed in her mind, a joyful Paul holding two charming children, a boy and a girl. Their freckled faces radiated such happiness. Next to them stood a smiling Samantha, happy and beautiful. Ms. Darcia closed her eyes and smiled at her imagination. God, what a mistake she had made. After this thought, another immediately popped into her head. What if Paul agreed to marry a girl similar to Meryl? The image of her son surfaced again, but different. Lonely, drinking, unhappy. She shook her head, dispelling the unwelcome visions. Persistent vibrations from her mobile phone brought her out of her thoughts. Adam sent the exact address and the name of the village. The possibility of finding Samantha seemed to give the weary woman a second wind. Since Paul and Samantha parted ways, more than five years have passed. Ms. Darcia still couldn't find her former future daughter-in-law. Immediately after Adam sent her the address of Samantha's hometown, she went there. However, she was met with bitter disappointment and unfriendly glances from the locals. She's not here, gone, a slovenly man in galoshes and a coverall rudely exclaimed. And you, women, go on your way. You're not welcome here. The man didn't mince words. Where did she go? Please, tell me, Ms. Darcia persisted. She took a wide step toward the man but stumbled. Her boot got stuck in the muddy ground. That's none of your business. She left, that's it. Wishing you all the best. The man walked past Ms. Darcia but suddenly stopped and turned around. I know who you are and what you did. God will punish you. And he slowly walked away. But Ms. Darcia had no intention of giving up. She tried to find something about Samantha on social media, visited all the profiles of users with that name, but in vain. It seemed as if the girl had never existed. One day, feeling desperate, she gave up all attempts to find Samantha. Meanwhile, things were getting worse for Paul. Now he was confined to a wheelchair. Technically, Paul could still walk, but he had no strength for it. Emaciated, sickly, and feeble, there was no trace left of the young and healthy guy. Ms. Darcia continued her efforts to free her son from this dreadful addiction, but every time Paul relapsed. He understood everything perfectly, but he no longer had the strength to fight the illness. Nor did he have the desire to live. Another spring arrived. Ms. Darcia's gardener rushed around the garden, tending to everything after the long winter. Wrapped in a warm blanket, Ms. Darcia sat in her small courtyard, staring at her laptop. 
Earlier that morning, she and Bill had brought Paul back home from yet another hospital. Right now, a new caregiver was with Paul. A young, full-bosomed girl, likely from a modest family. There was something vaguely reminiscent of Samantha about her. Ms. Darcia hoped that maybe Paul would fall in love again. Ms. Darcia, I can't take this, the caregiver approached, standing opposite, hands on her hips. What? What now? Your son. He's rude. I won't tolerate such treatment. You said he would like me, but he? The girl was beside herself with anger. Ms. Darcia calmly nodded. All right, you can go. Bill will pay. Thank you for your help. Without raising her eyes to the girl, she continued to look at the open laptop. Another one of her plans had failed. Lately, she had stopped reacting strongly to failures. It seemed like all emotions had long been spent. Lost in thought, she pondered. She understood that the days when Paul was at home would soon be over, and he would likely run away again. She absent-mindedly scrolled through the news feed. A news article about the recent opening of a new rehabilitation clinic caught her eye. Ms. Darcia opened the link, quickly scanning through the description. The clinic had opened a year ago, people wrote enthusiastic reviews, and the pictures of the clinic itself looked simply amazing. Ms. Darcia thought about placing Paul in preventive treatment before another relapse occurred. She dialed the clinic's number and scheduled an appointment. The midday spring sun dazzled her eyes, spraying its unbearable bright rays everywhere. Especially unbearable for eyes that had shed all their tears. The woman stepped out of the car and adjusted her sunglasses, waiting for Bill to retrieve Paul's wheelchair from the trunk. Done, Mr. Paul, do you need help getting out, or can you manage on your own? I can manage. Paul struggled to climb out of the car and slumped into the wheelchair. The sun dazzled him so much that for the first few seconds, he couldn't properly open his eyes. Ms. Darcia swallowed the lump in her throat. Paul, what do you say? Do you like it here? Finally overcoming the pain in his eyes, Paul spoke quietly and with anguish. Leave me, let me die in peace. Ms. Darcia bit her lip but stayed silent. She nodded to Bill, who obediently took the wheelchair by the handles and rolled Paul forward. They entered the clinic. Beautiful, the owner has good taste. Ms. Darcia sincerely admired the hospital's interior. Helpful staff immediately surrounded them. She filled out the necessary documents and waited for her son to be taken to his room. Meanwhile, Ms. Darcia decided to explore the hospital corridors. There was something attractively calming about its interior. She raised her head and looked at the transparent skylight adorning the spacious second-floor hall. The bright turquoise sky with large cumulus clouds put her in a meditative state. She would have continued her soothing walk if she hadn't collided forcefully with a girl unexpectedly emerging from around the corner. Hey, the girl screamed in surprise, and papers scattered from her hands. She looked at Ms. Darcia with concern, are you okay? Do you need help? Do you even watch where you're going? Ms. Darcia began in her usual manner but fell silent at the sight of the young girl's good and expensive watch on her wrist. The woman cleared her throat and straightened her shoulders. I apologize, I got lost in thought. And what brings you here? Your watch is amazing, we must know each other. I'm familiar with many respected families in this city. What's your name? You wouldn't know, the girl smirked, finishing collecting her papers, then stood up to her full height. She scrutinized the woman she had almost knocked over. Slightly hunched, tired, looking significantly older than her years. Dark circles under her eyes, deep sorrowful wrinkles around her mouth. Even the skillful expensive makeup poorly concealed these obvious traces of grief and tears. I'm the owner of this clinic, she finally said. No, you're definitely not familiar with my family. Can I help you with something? Are you our patient? The girl, plump but with a straight posture, neatly arranged light hair, and a beautiful, melodic voice, observed the woman in front of her. Are you kidding? A patient? I'm just here to look around, see what this new clinic is all about. I'm just browsing. 
Yes, Ms. Darcia decided to conceal the fact that she brought her son here for treatment of drug addiction. Not that she was particularly ashamed, it just felt a bit awkward. She proudly lifted her chin. So young and already the owner of your clinic? My respect. You've achieved a lot, and I'm sure you'll achieve more in the future. She forced a strained smile. In Ms. Darcia's mind, a thought raced about how she would love to see such a girl as her daughter-in-law. Thank you, the girl said a bit too dryly, continuing to scrutinize Ms. Darcia's face. Her gaze fixated on a mole above the woman's upper lip. Simultaneously, Ms. Darcia experienced a deja vu. I'm sorry, how should I address you? Samantha. You don't need to introduce yourself, I recognize you. Panic gripped Ms. Darcia. Could this be the Samantha she had spent so much effort searching for? Stunned by the unexpected revelation, the woman struggled to catch her breath. Samantha, is it really you? It's me. I'd like to say I'm glad to see you, but I'm not used to lying, unlike you. If you've finished looking around, I think it's time for you to go. And yes, I wouldn't want to see you as a patient in my clinic. Goodbye. Samantha confidently walked ahead. Samantha, Samantha, the woman rushed after her. Wait. What? Samantha stopped. A nasty feeling crept into her soul. Suddenly, she wanted to sting the would-be mother-in-law a bit more. Samantha, I'm asking you, don't run away. Ms. Darcia tried to compose herself and regain her former composure. Tell me how you are. After all, we're not complete strangers. Samantha raised her beautiful eyebrows. How? Not strangers. You seem to have forgotten a bit, Ms. Darcia. Well, I want to introduce you to someone. Her gaze softened slightly. With whom? Ms. Darcia was surprised. Perhaps you've married successfully? Samantha smiled subtly and walked ahead. Ms. Darcia followed her. The clinic owner led the visitor into her spacious office. With a gesture, she invited her to sit in a large leather chair. She walked behind the desk and dialed a number from the landline. Hello, Jessica, how are the kids? Bring them to me. Yes, right now. Samantha hung up the phone and looked attentively at Ms. Darcia. The kids. Ms. Darcia repeated the word, as if savoring it. Samantha, dear, have you really become a mother? Congratulations to you. Ms. Darcia pretended to be pleased with this turn of events, but in reality, this fact stung her. Yes, I have. Samantha rose from the table. I've never regretted it. My children mean everything to me. Exactly, absolutely right, dear. I hope now you understand why I did what I did. Now that you know maternal love, maybe you can understand me. Samantha's eyes narrowed in anger. She opened her mouth to reply, but at that moment, the office door swung open, and two little children rushed in, followed by a plump, pleasant-looking woman who appeared to be their nanny. Mama, mommy, the little boy exclaimed. The little girl silently approached her mother and cast a wary glance at the unfamiliar lady. The children looked like two peas in a pod. Twins, Ms. Darcia observed in surprise. The children, about five years old, were of the same age. The boy was more assertive, looking interestedly at Ms. Darcia. He walked closer and extended a chubby little hand. Hello, and who are you? the little boy politely asked. Studying his face, Ms. Darcia felt the ground slipping from under her feet. The distant past seemed to come alive in that moment. Bright, olive eyes, a small nose sprinkled with freckles, reddish-brown hair tousled and glistening with the remnants of lively games and running around. The woman, dumbfounded, shifted her gaze to the little girl. She was already comfortably settled in Samantha's arms. Her face, also adorned with freckles, displayed the same olive eyes. Her reddish-brown hair was fashioned into two charming braids. Forgetting the boy's question, Ms. Darcia stared questioningly at Samantha. They are. Not now, Samantha interrupted her, you understood everything correctly, but don't say anything in front of the children. 
she gently lowered her daughter to the floor and affectionately kissed the top of her head. Now, go with Jessica. Are these my grandchildren? Ms. Darcia interrupted with a faltering voice as soon as the door closed behind the trio. How could you hide them from us? I and Paul had the right to know. My son is their father. How dare you? Enough, Samantha sharply interrupted her tirade. Shame on you. I gave birth to and raised these children alone, without anyone's help. The fatherhood field on their birth certificates has a bold dash. Forget your claims. And now that you know you could have been a happy grandmother, you can leave. I won't detain you any longer. Ms. Darcia slumped, but then straightened up again. Samantha, please, allow me to see them. Let me help with money. I don't need your money, the young woman snapped. I never needed them. I'm absolutely self-sufficient, and I certainly don't need your money. The conversation is over. Never come to my clinic again. Security won't let you in. Samantha approached the door and dramatically swung it open. Please. In response, Ms. Darcia only sniffed. She desperately wanted to appear strong in front of this confident young woman, but despair and emotional pain got the better of her. Ms. Darcia sat back in the chair and began to cry plaintively. What's wrong? Samantha, surprised by this unexpected reaction, abruptly closed the door. She had always considered Ms. Darcia insensitive, cruel, and dangerous. But now, in front of her, sat a pitiful, sobbing old woman. Samantha approached the woman. What's happening to you? Should I call a doctor? Paul, my Paul. Ms. Darcia uttered her son's name between loud sobs. He's here, sick, helpless. I don't know how to help him. Where is he? Paul is our patient? Yes. Ms. Darcia burst into a new wave of tears. Samantha felt a darkness creeping over her eyes. After her father's death, she vowed not only never to drink alcohol but also to do everything possible to help people struggling with addiction. Establishing this clinic wasn't easy for her. But the thought that, thanks to this center, doctors could bring back people from the brink of death, reunite them with their loving families, warmed her heart and motivated her to work tirelessly. Samantha remembered Paul, affectionate and cheerful. Her heart ached. Could it be him? Samantha knocked on the door of the hospital room. No one answered. She gently opened the door and peeked inside. What she saw shocked her. On the hospital bed lay what used to be her Paul. Thin, endlessly tired, and sickly, with an almost bald head and hollow, gray cheeks. Deep, dark bags were visible under his eyes, and a terrible wheelchair stood next to the bed. Samantha gasped. Paul. She approached him and sat on the edge of the bed. Leave. He didn't even look in her direction, didn't open his eyes. Paul, what happened to you? He slowly opened his eyes and looked at the visitor. His gaze took on a more conscious expression. Samantha. Tears welled up in her eyes. Yes, it's me. But really? Is this drugs? Paul fell silent. For the first time in a long while, he felt something akin to a human emotion. He remembered how deeply he once loved this girl, how terribly they parted ways. Overwhelming shame and pain washed over him. Forgive me, my love. Forgive also my crazy mother. Forgive me for not realizing the truth in time, for not bringing you back. He looked her straight in the eyes. But why didn't you come to me when you finally understood that I was set up? Samantha turned to the window, hiding her tears. All these years, she had been tormented by bitter, painful resentment. I, on that day, drowned my sorrows like never before. There was an accident, and then. I remembered well your attitude toward drunks like me. I was ashamed. I didn't want you to see me like that. Then pills, and then. You certainly don't need such a wreck. No one needs it, he added bitterly, you deserve a normal life. But tell me, what are you doing here, he suddenly asked. Samantha lowered her head. 
She had long awaited the day when Paul would come to her, apologize, embrace her, scream about understanding everything, about being wrong. But it never happened. And now. This is my clinic, she simply replied. He forced a smile. Just as you dreamed. About five to six months later, Paul slowly began to recover. The meeting with Samantha gave him the motivation to quit drugs once and for all. For the first time in the terrible years, he approached his treatment seriously and tried his best to follow all the rules of the rehabilitation center. Samantha's clinic was indeed very good. Outsiders were not allowed in. The security guards were incorruptible. Many addicted people managed to overcome their harmful habits here. Perhaps it was because the owner personally faced the terrible adversity of addiction in her life. Gradually, Paul got up from his wheelchair. He started moving more, exercising his muscles, although the leg damaged in the accident never fully recovered. He seriously took up therapeutic exercises and even quit smoking. At first, Samantha didn't allow Paul to see his own children. She didn't want their first impression of their father to be a shock. But when Paul finally achieved relatively good physical shape, celebrated six months of sobriety, and started to resemble his former self more, Samantha introduced him to the children. It took him tremendous effort not to burst into tears upon seeing his younger Paul and little Miranda. Samantha rejected his repeated proposals for reconciliation. She set conditions for him, a full year of sober and healthy living. Paul understood it all and patiently waited, adhering to all the procedures prescribed by doctors. He was determined not to return to the hell he had lived in for the past few years. However, Samantha couldn't forgive her future mother-in-law right away. It took her a lot, a very long time to even start communicating with her. Ms. Darcia, in turn, realized a lot and repeatedly asked for forgiveness from her son and his beloved. On the day when Samantha and Paul finally got married, the same bright, spring sun was shining. The wedding was very modest, with only the closest people invited. Two cute twins, a brother and sister, presented their parents with wedding rings on a sparkling tray. Ms. Darcia sat quietly, like a mouse, often dabbing her eyes with her damp handkerchief until her faithful Bill replaced it with a fresh one. After the ceremony, Adam approached her with an unfamiliar girl. Ms. Darcia, how glad I am to see you. And I am so happy for Paul, words can't express it. Let me introduce you, this is my fiancé, Alana. The modest, attractive girl politely smiled at Ms. Darcia. Fiancé, so you're divorced? And the children? It's been six months already. But, of course, I don't abandon my children. And the business? To hell with it. I left everything to Merrill. I can build my life from scratch. He looked tenderly at his companion. Ms. Darcia beamed with a smile. Engaged for long? Not very. By the way, Alana works as a nurse at Samantha's clinic. We met when I visited Paul. And who is she? Ms. Darcia interrupted herself mid-sentence. Out of habit, she wanted to ask about Alana's family and origins, but she stopped herself in time. After all the events that had unfolded, the woman finally understood that money, background, and connections had absolutely no significance. Oh, forget it. I'm happy for you, she said. Thank you, Adam smiled in response. It's so great that everything worked out for Paul and Samantha. Grandchildren ran up to Ms. Darcia. Grandma, Grandma, look what we've got. Their faces were adorned with amusing face paint. The happy grandmother seated her grandchildren on her lap. She looked at her son and daughter-in-law. Their faces radiated love and tenderness. Samantha looked stunningly beautiful in a simple cream dress. Ms. Darcia pondered. How did she not notice this beauty? Thought the woman and smiled. What more could she wish for, as her dreams had finally come true?